No matter what craft or vocation you're a part of, there are these standouts, this top 1% who are like these intellectual giga chats. Like they're probably getting up at 3 a.m. And then by the time you wake up, they're already done with their work for the day. They're already publishing their 40th click funnel and their third doggy coin. But the truth is for the most part, they're not that special. They're not geniuses. They're not that different than you are. They just happen to know a recipe, a list of ingredients that when combined really do result in incredible, what could be perceived as superhuman levels of output and creativity. There's no doubt in my mind that this is what separates the successful and consistent from the inconsistent and unsuccessful. No matter what you're working on, no matter what your medium or dream, you need to understand this to be successful. Uh, what is this mysterious thing? Well, the good news is, is it's not another half-assed hack or some shortcut. This is something you already have that every human being can access. In fact, it's a state you probably naturally achieved many times in your life. And I'll tell you what it is right after you click that like and subscribe button. But you already know, because I probably put it in the title. I'm talking about flow, reaching a flow state. And it often takes on this air of mystery, but it's not really that mysterious at all. I mean, in a way it is, in a way everything is incredibly strange and mysterious the more you think about it. But this is just like achieving any other state of mind in that it's well studied, it's well understood what's happening in the brain, and researchers know how to consistently achieve this state that we call flow. So the first step to demystifying flow, what is it? It's a state of mind you achieve that shrinks your ego and your sense of self. It quiets the inner critic and it allows you to just completely focus on the task at hand, completely focus on what you're doing. And of course, that's the kind of focus you're gonna need if you wanna reach the peak of your abilities. You're gonna need to get there consistently. Another thing that's gonna go a long way toward understanding flow is looking at this really simple chart called the challenge skills balance. Basically, you have an X and a Y axis. On one axis, you have a perceived skill level that's too easy, like this task is way too easy for me, and then on the other, you're gonna have too difficult. Flow lies between what is too easy and too difficult. And it makes total sense, right? If a task is too easy, you can daydream, you can put forth minimal effort, you're not going to achieve flow when a task is too easy. And just the opposite, when it's too hard, you're not going to achieve flow because it's gonna make you anxious. You're gonna realize that it's above your skill level, it's over your head. So flow lives in between. It's pretty clear that it lives closer to the maximum level that you're comfortable with, so you do want to push yourself. Uh, the writer Stephen Kotler talks about you want to reach approximately 4% beyond where you're comfortable. And I mean, even with that at this point, you're starting to see that flow is not that mysterious. It's really a skill. And like any skill, it can be learned. It can be optimized. You can build habits around it. And this brings me to the heart of this video. What is most vital to understand if you do want to build those flow-inducing habits? Flow triggers and flow blockers. Without understanding these flow triggers and flow blockers and how to work with them at least a little bit, flow is going to remain mysterious to you. It is going to remain elusive. So with that, I want to get into a few specific flow triggers and flow blockers that I think when you combine them, you are going to more reliably enter flow and reap its benefits. Before I implemented them, I always felt like I was swimming upstream. And swimming upstream is not a way to go with the flow. And before I go any further, I have to shout out somebody I already briefly mentioned, the best-selling author and flow researcher Stephen Kotler and his tremendous book, the art of the impossible definitely pick that up for a deeper dive 
not only on flow triggers, but flow in general. I mean, he outlines every single angstrom of the flow process and building better creative habits. I've actually been lucky enough to do a couple of podcasts with Steven. I'll definitely leave the link to those in the description. But moving on, flow triggers and flow blockers. They're pretty much exactly what they sound like. A flow trigger is a habit or state of mind that's gonna help you enter a flow state. A flow blocker is the opposite. These are by no means all of the flow triggers. In fact, researchers have identified 22 of them. Steven goes through all of them in his book, but I think these are the most important at least to get started with. The first flow trigger and potential blocker is your environment, and this is both physical and mental. Do you have a physical place to flow? Do you create a space in which you mindfully fortify yourself from distractions so that you can attain that laser focus. Kotler has a great line in his book. He says, when he's working with a company, if they're not willing to put a sign on their door that says, fuck off, I'm flowing, then they're not gonna be able to do this work. So if you're not answering an unequivocal yes, uh, that you do have an ideal environment, a rich environment, a flow-friendly environment that you can go to every day, then that's really prescription number one, is find that for yourself, make that for yourself. And this also, like I said before, includes mental space. It definitely includes digital space. You're definitely going to have to hit that focus button on your iPhone, let people know that you're not to be distracted during this time. Another thing I wanna to briefly touch on when it comes to the flow trigger of environment is what it means to have a rich environment rich problems to work on. In the book, Kotler points out this should include novelty, unpredictability, and complexity. That cocktail of novelty, unpredictability, and complexity drives dopamine and norepinephrine, which makes us excited. It makes us curious. It makes us really tuned in to whatever we're working on. This is why, personally speaking, I think it's really important to act on an inspiration when it's fresh, because if it's fresh, it's novel. You're excited about it. If you grab onto it right then and there, I think you're going to be at your most potent. Personally, I find if I wait, I'm not as excited. I start to second guess it. And this feels a little bit abstract to talk about. Like, how are you going to get novelty, complexity, and unpredictability in your environment? Like, how are you going to go into your office and suddenly get excited about whatever it is that you're working on or go into your studio or wherever it is you work on your craft and suddenly be shocked at something in a space that's really familiar? Well, the answer is you have to go seek it out. Maybe you have to go for a walk in a new neighborhood. Maybe you have to expose yourself to ideas that are going to stoke your curiosity, that are going to stir novelty in your mind before working. Remember, the brain is a feedback loop machine, so even if whatever you're working on for the day doesn't stoke that, you can expose yourself to these things from other sources before working. The next flow triggers and potentially blockers that I want to talk about are motivation, both internal and external motivators. When it comes to motivation, we're really biased toward the external. We usually think about things we have to do because we're obligated, because there will be some consequence if we don't. And if you completely lack those external motivators, that definitely can be a flow blocker. That definitely can be a barrier. But most of us already have some level of external motivation, something that we want, something that we dream about, something that we're afraid of. So external motivators do play an important role, but I think where we're mostly lacking and where we can do the most work is with intrinsic motivation. But there are three that I want to pay special attention to because Kotler and researchers singled these out as one of the most potent intrinsic motivation stacks. Curiosity, passion, and purpose. If you feel passionate and curious and a sense of purpose from what you're doing, you're going to be laser focused. So if you're working on something that's important to you, reflect on how it really feeds those three intrinsic motivators. Stoke those three intrinsic motivators in yourself as you're working. Remind yourself why you're working on this. I get that if these things aren't being stoked by what you're working on, that might be hard to find 
but this might be a good time to reconsider if whatever you're working on doesn't feed those intrinsic motivators. Moving on, although it's difficult to whittle down those 22 flow triggers to just a few for this video, I knew I needed to touch on this one. The next one is goals. Because again, your goals can either be a flow trigger or a flow blocker if you're not setting goals in the right way. Let me unpack that. When it comes to setting goals, People have a habit to get way too meta. People have a habit of thinking of a goal as something like, I'm on the podium holding that gold medal. I'm driving the Maserati. I have a billion doggy coins. They're not flow triggers because they don't tell you what to do. They aren't goals that you can directly act upon. And this is what I mean when I say they can actually be flow blockers. If you don't know what to do, you can't be focused. You can't get into that brain state you need to achieve to be in flow. And I'll actually touch on that for a minute. Flow relies on a brain state called transient hypofrontality. What this means is our frontal lobe quiets down. The part of our brain where our sense of self lives, where our ego lives, where our inner critic lives, quiets down. And this enables us to completely focus on the task at hand. If you're imagining yourself on that podium, if you're imagining yourself at the wheel of that Maserati, you are not focused, you are not flowing, you are not completely enmeshed in whatever it is you need to be doing. So getting to the point, if you want to make those meta goals a flow trigger instead of a flow blocker, you need to break them down into highly actionable steps. Uh, to give a practical example, for me, when I do a podcast now, it's a well-oiled machine. I know what day I'm going to record the podcast. I know what day I'm going to edit it. I know what day I'm going to write ideas for the intro and publish. I just sit down and do it. I don't need to think too hard about it. Of course, it wasn't always that way. It does take time to develop that flow channel, that easy set of tasks you can just disappear into. And maybe you're thinking, oh, well, that's great for you now that you've published hundreds of podcasts. That's easy for you to say, well, believe me, friend, I'm dealing with this ramp up process all over again with YouTube. It takes a lot longer for me to get to the publish button on YouTube, but honestly, that's okay because I know that these things are always crawl, walk, run, and eventually I will be at that place with YouTube too, and you'll be there with whatever you're doing too. And don't get me wrong, you don't have to be hyper-organized, but you do have to have clear goals that don't create turbulence for you to actually get into flow. And if you do that, the small goals will compound into that larger goal eventually. This next one is sort of a combination of points. One that I wanna get out of the way right away because I think it's so important is to respect the process, respect the muse, meaning show up every day, sacrifice to it as often as you can. One of my favorite quotes that's perhaps cliche at this point by the author Stephen King, who has unbelievably prolific output, obviously, is, I don't write because I have something to say, I have something to say because I write. The more reps you do, the easier it's going to be to enter that flow channel. And then speaking of those sessions, this dovetails into the next point. How long can a flow session be? How long should they ideally be? Because you cannot stay in flow forever. You cannot force flow. Researchers have actually found that ideal focus, peak focus, aka flow states, last from about 90 minutes to 120 minutes. Can you push beyond that on occasion? Yes, I definitely think so. I know that I have, but I also know that around that 90 minute to 120 minute mark, I really start to get distracted. Sometimes I only get about 60 minutes in before it just starts to break down and evaporate. This again, returning to one of my earlier points is why it's so important to have an environment that's conducive to not being interrupted because if you do get in that flow channel and 30 minutes in you get interrupted it can be really difficult to get back in so respect the muse show up work within the time limits that nature has put on us and protect yourself from distractions so let's review our ingredients my friends you want a flow conducive 
environment filled with novelty, complexity, and unpredictability where you're not going to be distracted. The second ingredient is to actively reflect on your motivators, both external and intrinsic. Why are you doing the work that you're doing? In particular, pay special attention to curiosity, passion, and purpose, that powerful intrinsic stack. Ingredient number three is having clear, actionable goals. Uh, I wanna say that this can be more challenging if you're working on things that are creative and open-ended, but if you are a creative open-ended person, you can figure out how to make those creative things into actionable goals. Like if I'm working on idea generation or brainstorming or thinking of ideas for a podcast or a YouTube video, you can still create clear goals out of an open-ended task like that. It doesn't mean they have to be the best ideas. It doesn't mean that they have to be ideas I'll even necessarily follow through on, but I'll say, okay, I need to come up with five ideas before I move on. And then our final ingredient was to show up to the process, honor that muse, but work within the constraints that nature has put upon our brains. Plan for blocks of 90 minutes to 120 minutes, and don't try to push yourself beyond it too often because it's honestly not going to work. At least not according to my experience and the research I've read. Let me know what you think about this flow recipe in the comments, what some challenging flow blockers have been for you, what some of your favorite flow triggers are. Definitely pick up a copy of Stephen Kotler's book, The Art of the Impossible. And that is it for this transmission, everybody. Much love. Hit the like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. As you know, tickling those algorithms is the primary currency here on YouTube. I'll see you next time.